All right, guys. The name of this message is going to be the 4th of July. <laughs> the 4th of July. And of course, as you all know, this is the 4th of July. And uh, it's a special day for us, a day that you could say we, we celebrate independence. It's uh, the, the pride and, and the love of the freedom that we have of living here in America in such a free country. It's just us celebrating, uh, just, just being us and being free and, 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 and being separate from everybody else and doing our own thing, doing things our way here in America, having freedom winning the war, winning the battle, having control over our own selves, being free, being independent, the 4th of July. Well, like I said, the name of this is the 4th of July. And so let me tell you what this is going to be about. What do I mean by that when I say the 4th of July? Well, we celebrate this day as independence as a country, as a whole. But this sermon is about those of us or those of you who may be wanting to celebrate your independence as a person. But there's a problem. There's a reason why, whether it be for days, months, or even years now, you have not been able to fully celebrate yourself as a free, independent individual and the reason why is because of your lies. Get it? The 4th of July <laughs> wanting to celebrate independence, but you can't because of the lies and of the deception that you've thrown out there. You may say, what do you mean? Well, maybe some of you out there, maybe you've been in a relationship. Maybe you've been in a friendship. Maybe you've been in a marriage. But maybe somewhere along the way you stopped being friends, or maybe you broke up, maybe you got a divorce, whether it be something recent or whether it's been something that has happened uh, a long time ago. But maybe you're, you, you had a time where you could have told the truth of some things. Maybe the reason you wanted out of that relationship, whether it be a friendship, marriage, whatever, was all uh, something that you didn't want to talk about. So you lied to get out of it. Or maybe you didn't lie, but at the same time, you didn't exactly tell the truth either. So maybe you kind of just did some deceitful things to get out of that relationship. And so now, after all this time, you have found that even though you wanted your freedom and your independence from that person, you can't fully celebrate it. Why? Because you've got all these lies or all these deceptions that you have to hold on to, and they keep you from fully standing out strong with your chest out. You can't have any uh, uh, self-pride or self-respect in yourself. You can't fully enjoy that independence because you can't fully be free because you're bound by those lies. Maybe you've had to help other people lie or cheat or deceive your way out of some stuff. And so now you have to be careful of what you do and what you say and who you hang around because what you do and what you say and who you hang around will expose the truth of the matter, will expose the reasons why you've called off that bond that you've had with someone. And so you can't fully be truthful. You can't be fully open about the truth of the matter. And as much as you want to portray it in your mind that you're free and that you have your independence, you have probably come to terms by now that you're not as free as what you thought you were because you weren't honest about the cheating, because you were not honest about the fact that maybe you were in love with somebody else, maybe because you were not honest about the fact that there were hidden things. Maybe you were afraid of the commitment and just didn't want to admit it. Maybe you were afraid of what other people thought or what other people said or what other people would have to say. But for whatever the, the reason was, maybe there were a variety of reasons and not just one, but whatever the reason was, because you kept it hidden for so long and because you've had to hide things from people, you spent so many uh, times, so many days, so many weeks or years uh, being careful what you say and what you do to the point where you have put yourself in more of a bondage than more of a freedom. 
And so maybe you're at a point where you've realized, you know, maybe it wasn't worth holding on to this lie, holding on to this deception anymore, any longer. Maybe it's just time for me to be me. Maybe it's just time for me to stop pretending and playing games and playing hide and go seek and all these other things. Maybe it's just time for me to just come right on out and just be honest about the matter so that I can get all this off my chest so that I don't have to hold on to the lies and the deception anymore. Maybe I need to just go ahead and just put it out there what the truth really is. It'll set me free. It'll set some other people free and we can just go on about our business. Sure, it may upset some folks, but maybe it's time for me to really truly have my independence on this 4th of July day. I want it to be the 4th of July, not the 4th of July. I don't want to lie anymore. And so maybe if that's where you're at, if that's how you feel, maybe this message is for you. However, I also want to say for those of you who maybe you feel like you've been done wrong, maybe you feel like you've been lied to, you feel like maybe there has been some things that you haven't been told by your ex-best friend or your ex-significant other or your ex-husband, ex-wife, whatever. But what I want to let you know right up front is while you might be sitting there clapping and cheering about this message and saying, that's right, you tell them. <laughs> what you must understand is that there must be forgiveness. Even if someone does tell you something that hurts when they come out and tell you the truth, you must understand that it is important for you to have forgiveness for you to be willing to let it go, for you to be willing to not hold what they have to say over their heads. After all, maybe you've waited and waited and waited for the truth. And so if you're uh, possibly going to get your truth now, you have to be willing to say, okay, I'm glad that I know that now I can have some peace. I want you to have your peace too. Let's both let it go. Let's both move on. Not, well, now that you finally told me, let me hold it over your head. All you're going to do is make them regret telling you the truth, and it's going to make other people consider not being honest with you because they're going to feel like you're just going to hold things over their head about different issues as well. So I want this to be a somewhat quick message. It won't take too long. There's not much to really uh, read and discuss, but this will definitely be one of my storytelling sermons where I tell you stories about something that I've gone through or been through to help uh, get points across. But let's start here in Genesis chapter 20, right here at verse 1. And this is like my third sermon in a row talking about Abraham and Sarah. I don't know, but sometimes it just happens. They The, the sermons just have a flow to them. They just connect in some kind of way. It just happens. But Anyway, it says this, And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country, and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur, and journed, or sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech king of Gerar sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night, and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the man which thou hast taken, or sorry, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? She, or sorry, said he unto me, She is my sister, and she, even she herself, hath said, He is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears, and the men were sore afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us, and what have I offended thee, that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? 
Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought, Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. What has happened here is this. Abraham and his wife, they're traveling, and they've gotten into a place where they feel like the people there don't fear God. They don't take God seriously. And so because he feels like they're not going to take God seriously, he has the mindset of, well, when we go into this place, I'm just going to have my wife pretend to just be my sister and I'll pretend to be her brother. And by me doing this, they will not try to take her from me. They won't, they won't try to do anything. They'll, they'll, they'll leave her alone because that's just my sister. But we see right off the bat with them telling this lie that it actually makes the situation worse. Because right away, Abimelech, King Abimelech, takes his wife because he doesn't know it's his wife. He simply thinks it's his sister. In other words, he probably would have been better off just being honest and saying it's my wife and then there's less likely a chance she would have been taken from him. And so this king almost sins by, by messing around with somebody else's wife, but God has to stop him and he's like, God, you know, I, I didn't know. And God's like, I know, I know. That's why I'm telling you now, <laughs> you know. Sometimes there are instances where we would be better off just being honest about what's going on in our relationships versus pretending other things. I want to share this story. It's just a funny story that was just on my mind recently. And I thought, you know, this kind of goes good in a way with this sermon, I guess. <laughs> but I want to, to share this. And, of course, it, and I'm sure some of y'all, all of y'all know this, but I'm a lesbian, but the thing about it is there's always a time when you're younger where a lot of times you just kind of give in to what's expected of you. And so what's expected or what was expected of me being a girl would be to date a guy. And so years ago, back when I was in junior high, I did date this guy. I was in eighth and I believe he was in seventh grade or something like that. And we were together. We didn't really hang out outside of school. We just saw each other at school and we were, a, you know, a couple. Y'all know how it is when kids are young. They, you know, just hanging out them to them. That's just dating, you know, or whatever. I don't know. But um, so we were together and I remember, you know, things were going all right. And then all of a sudden there was this dance coming up because, of course, we're not old enough to go to prom, really, but they give us, you know, a little junior high dance. And so we, we had a school dance for us, and I remember him telling me way prior to the dance, well, you know, I have a baseball game that same night, so I don't know if I'll make it to the dance, but if I do, I'll be a little late coming to this dance. And I was like, okay. Well, it gets closer time for the dance, and then one day I'm at home and I get a phone call. The phone call is from the best friend of this guy that I was, you know, in a so-called relationship with. And he calls me and he's saying, hey, since he's not going to be there at this dance, will you dance with me? And I'm like, well, why would I why would I do that? Why would I dance with somebody else other than my boyfriend? But especially the, the boyfriend's best friend, you know, that's not right. That would be a slap in the face of him. And he was all like, well, you know, he doesn't have to know that we dance together. So you want to dance together at the dance? And I'm just like, no. So I'm continuously trying to explain to him the obvious reasons why this would not be the brightest of ideas. <laughs> But he just kept insisting. And I couldn't quite figure out why he kept going on and on. So I was like, you know what? I got a smart one for him. So I go, hey, instead of asking me if I'll dance with you, why don't you ask him, your friend, 
if you can dance with his girlfriend and see what he says, see if it's all right with them. <laughs> I thought it was a slick one, but he still kept insisting, oh, he won't care. I know he won't care. And I'm just like, how, how do you know this? So then suddenly I get quiet and I hear this whispering over the phone. And it was my boyfriend whispering with him. And I guess they were both on the phone at the same time, either that or they had it on three way or something. But but he had been listening to the conversation and he was like, ask her this, ask her that, blah, blah, blah. Right. Whispering stuff to say to me, whispering stuff to his friend to say to me. And I'm sitting there listening like, am I not supposed to hear him whispering? Why? What is he doing? Why is he having his friend Ask me to dance with him. It never made sense. But what I ended up realizing later was that he was wanting to break up with me. But instead of breaking up with me, he was trying to see if I would like, I guess, cheat on him or do something wrong. So that way he could point at me and be like, aha, you did me wrong. Let's break up. <laughs> so what ended up happening was one day. Uh, the boyfriend calls me and he's he's sounding all sad. And he's like, you know, I just want to be free. Don't you want to be free? I just want to have my freedom. Don't you want to be free? And I was just like, no, I'm good. <laughs> you know, but he just kept going. I just want to be free. So finally, after him going on and on and whining, I'm like, OK. And he's like, OK, and hangs up the phone. Next day I get to school and people are coming up to me being all like, why did you break up with him? <laughs> and I'm like, what are you talking about? He's the one that wanted the breakup. What do you mean? I didn't break up with him. He said he wanted to be free. So I just went along with it. And so I began asking people, why, you know, why did he break up with me? Because he wasn't telling me why he wasn't giving me a legit reason why. Somebody ended up saying, well, from what I heard, he broke up with you because you were too much of a tomboy. Because You know, I dress like a guy and act like a guy. So I was like, OK. Well, then a buddy of mine came up to me one day and she was just like, hey, Colby, uh, your ex asked me out. And I, you know, I think he's a cool guy and everything, but I, I, I felt kind of weird saying yes to him because I didn't know if it would be good to date the ex of one of my friends. So I thought I'd come ask you, would you have a problem with me dating him? I mean, he asked me and I said, you know, that's fine. We're done. You know, I'm not a jealous type person. If you want to, you can. But in the back of my mind, I was thinking if he that if he broke up with me for being too much of a tomboy, why is he wanting to now date her? See, this particular girl, she didn't dress like a guy, but she, she hung with the guy. She kind of acted like a guy sometimes. And she was real kind of buff for a girl our age. In fact, she played football on the little uh, little boys' f uh, football team, the, the junior football team or whatever. So I'm thinking, in a way, she's more of a tomboy than I am. So me being a tomboy must not be the reason why. So what's the reason why, you know, for him breaking up with me? I, I want to know why. Why? You know, if, if we're not going to be together, cool, but at least tell me the real reason why. So I began asking even more and somebody said, well, he said that you like Pokemon too much. Funny thing about it was this. There was a shirt that I used to wear that had Pokemon on it. But but that was really it. If you didn't ever see me in that shirt, you probably would never know that I like Pokemon because I didn't really talk about Pokemon much because none of my friends were very into Pokemon. So other than that shirt, me wearing that shirt, I didn't see what the big deal was. It's not like I was some obsessed fan of Pokemon or something. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and accept the reality that I'm never going to know the real reason why I've been broken up with, but whatever. Now, obviously, that was years ago. I don't have nothing against the guy. You know, now I can look back on it and laugh because it's funny to me now. I have forgiveness. You know, it ain't no big, no big deal, no big grudge. But I simply use that story just to kind of give you an example of what I mean, of how sometimes people might feel at the time of, of those issues, those breakups or whatever, or those divorces or those friendships being torn apart. And then people not saying the real reasons why or not giving a reason why at all. Sometimes it's better to just be honest up front. 
instead of lying and, and trying to make it seem like they're the bad guy or seeming like they wanted the breakup, why not just be honest and say, okay, I, I want this separation, this breakup, here's the reason why, let me just go ahead and be honest versus, you know, holding something over somebody's head or making them seem like the bad guy to others to cover up something. It's usually better to just tell the truth instead of telling a lie and then dragging it out. All right, if you don't mind, go with me to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 11. Just want to read through this real quick. It says this, starting at the beginning, it says, And it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbi. But David tarried still at Jerusalem, and it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him. And he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness. And she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and he went not down to his house. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down into the house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down unto thine house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife, as thou livest and as thy soul liveth? I will not do this thing. And David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day, and the morrow, and the morrow, sorry, 13. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him drunk. And at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. So what has happened here is this. You've got... David, King David, he has his army, they're out in battle, but he stays behind. He sees Bathsheba, this beautiful woman bathing, and he sends for her. The problem is that this woman, she's already married. She has a husband. Her husband, Uriah, is part of David's army, so he's out in battle. So he decides to take advantage of the fact that this woman's husband isn't around, and he messes around with her, gets her pregnant, and then come to find out that, you know, it's his child. He's trying to figure out a way how to get out of it. He wants to know how to get out of this situation so that the truth does not come out, so that he doesn't have any issues, any problems with people, so that he doesn't tarnish his reputation 
So he has to be a little bit deceitful. And so what he does is he has Uriah come back and he makes it seem like he just wants some information from him. He just wants to know how the battle is doing and he just wants to be good and welcoming to him. But his plan in his mind is, well, if I bring him home and let him stay the night, of course he's going to want to go home and lay down with his wife and have a good time with her. And then she can say to him, okay, you know, I'm pregnant and it'll seem like it's his kid because the timing would be just right. But what ends up happening is Uriah decides, you know what, since all those people are still out there uh, on the front lines battling, it wouldn't be fair for me to be able to go in and enjoy my home and enjoy my wife. I'm going to just stay out here. I'm going to chill out outside. I'm not going to go in. And he even tries getting Uriah drunk to try to get him to, to, to go and, 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 and mess around, but he still doesn't do it. And so what he ends up doing, what David ends up doing, is he sends word out to some people in the army through this letter to basically set Uriah up. He's like, hey, set him up, put him in the hottest, heaviest battle, and retire from him. Move back, put him in a position to where he's going to get killed. Just allow him to be taken out. So in his mind, he's got it all played out. He set it up to where he can keep on covering his tracks. And so what he's doing, he's not necessarily lying, but he's being deceitful. In other words, he's setting it up to where the truth doesn't have to come out. Sometimes uh, you listen. Sometimes it's not always about not lying or lying. Sometimes being deceitful and manipulative with people and trying to control people uh, like they're just pieces on a chessboard or a checkerboard, sometimes that by itself is the same as not being truthful. And so he does this, and what ends up happening is it backfires on him. Yes, Uriah gets killed, but when it's time for the baby to be born, he learns that the child will not live and he cries out to God to let the child live but God does not let the child live and he ends up being sorrowful because of this and why do I bring this up let me share this with you this little story another story like I said this is going to be one of those story time sermons this story isn't about me though this is about one of my my friends from Years ago, back in school, uh, this friend of mine, she was black, and she was dating this guy that was white. So they were an interracial couple. Aren't interracial couples always just adorable? They are, but anyway. So they were together for a while, and it seemed like things were going good, but something happened. All of a sudden, the guy started being really mean to her out of nowhere, just doing mean things and saying mean things. It was just really nasty toward her out of nowhere. And and she put up with it and put up with it, and it got to a point where, you know, they just had too many problems, and they decided to break up. But he was hiding something from her. He was hiding the truth. You see, it wasn't that he was somebody who was pretending to be nice and then all of a sudden showed his true colors and became mean and angry to show who he really was. That wasn't who he really was. He was actually a pretty nice, decent guy. But what happened was this. He, he Y'all know how it is when you're in a relationship. There comes a point where after you date for so long, you want to introduce each other to, to the parents like, hey, come to my house, come to dinner, come meet my folks. He started to realize that he could have a little bit of confrontation with folks in his family because of her. Why? He had people in his family who were racist, and he was very afraid of what his parents would think of her. He was scared of what folks 
in his family and people that he knew would say if they found out he was in a committed relationship with a black girl. And so after uh, thinking on this for so long, it started to scare him and start to worry him. And he had decided that he just didn't think he could go through it. He just didn't think that he wanted to to uh, take that risk of having people shun him and turn their back on him and naysay him and think little of him. He already didn't think a whole lot uh, of himself really uh, anyway. And so uh, because of that, that was the reason why he had started being so mean to her. He didn't really want to break up with her, but at the same time, he was trying to uh, switch things up and be kind of rude to her in hopes that she would just detach from him and not want to have anything to do with him. It was like a way of saying goodbye without actually having to say goodbye. And so he just kept hiding the truth for so long. But what ended up happening was years later, he had so much regret, so much re regret that he didn't stay with her, so much regret that he didn't just come out and tell the truth and stand up for their relationship and not care what anybody thought. And I even remember... Uh, my buddy was telling me about how uh, this one time he had came up to her workplace and she could tell he had been drinking and, and he had came up there and he was just pouring his heart out to her and just, just saying, you know, please take me back. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have done you the way I did you. It was even to the point where he, she said he was pulling money out of his pocket, money he had got out the bank just trying to hand 20s to her, I guess as a way of, of I don't know, trying to buy her back or something, I don't know, but just a desperate attempt to get her back because he was just so sorrowful and so full of regret and so full of tears and so full of emotion. And so just like how he felt the need to cover up the relationship and hide the tracks, uh, kind of like how David felt the need to cover up and hide the tracks. And so the end result was him uh, being sorrowful and full of regret, similar to how David ended up being sorrowful and full of regret, all for the sake of keeping the truth to themselves instead of standing up for the relationship. And so I just wanted to show those dynamics there. Here's one story that I share of the Bible of, of, of uh, lying to keep the reality of a, of a relationship from being brought out to the light. And then another instance where I share a story with you about not necessarily doing a lot of lying, but a lot of sneaky deceitfulness to cover stuff up, to make things appear one way when it's really something else. But we do all these things to cover up stuff, cover up uh, uh, fears and cover up things like cheating and cover up things like uh, the, the concerns and cares of the world instead of being uh, a person that decides, you know what, I'm going to let love win. I'm going to let love rule out. I'm going to let perfect love cast out fear which is what the Bible says. And it also lets us know that God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so those are just some things to take into consideration. But now let me move on. I don't want to drag this out too much longer. Go with me to Isaiah. And this will be the last part that I go to. Isaiah chapter 53. Let's see here. Yeah, starting right here at the beginning, it says this. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has 
have borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. And I just wanted to bring that up to say this, you know, we, we, we read these verses and it lets us know some of what Jesus would go through being tortured, being humiliated, smacked around, spat on, hung on the cross, whipped, rejected, frowned upon, people gambling for his clothes underneath him, madness. But he went through those things for us. He was despised, or sorry, despised and rejected by men for us, and he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities, and it's through the stripes, the beating that he took for us that we are healed. And so he went through all these horrendous, terrible things for us for different reasons, one of those reasons being forgiveness. He went through those things so that we could be in right standing with God and so that we could be forgiven of our sins, of our iniquities, of our transgressions, so that we could have that relationship with God our Father, so that we could have uh, our eternal life. Forgiveness. As Christians, we are supposed to be forgiving because to be a Christian means to be Christ-like, like Christ, and so if he went through all these things so that we could be forgiven, surely we should be able to forgive others. Sometimes it may be hard, but I'll say all this because if you're a person who maybe soon you may have someone come to you and say, hey, this is why uh, things didn't play out the way they should have. The reason why the relationship, the friendship, the marriage, the whatever did not continue the way that it should have and the way that I just threw it down the drain and the way that I treated you this way and that way. This is the reason why. This is is the truth behind it. Now I want to tell you the whole story. I know that it's in the past and I'm not trying to get us to go back to the past, but I just want to make things right. I just want you to be able to have closure, to have peace. I don't want to hide this anymore. You know, when that if that happens, you've got to be willing to forgive even if it's a hard, bitter pill you have to swallow when you hear the truth. Hey, it's like the saying, you get what you ask for. If you wanted to know for so long the truth and you've kept asking and kept asking, it wouldn't make sense to get the truth and, and then hold that truth over their head and make them feel bad because all you're going to do is put them in the mindset of, well, I shouldn't have uh, came out and told the truth. I should have just kept it to myself. I guess I'll hold everything else, uh, every other truth from that person and from everybody else to come because this is just how I'm going to be treated. We must be willing to forgive, and you must also understand that forgiveness is good for you and for the person you're forgiving. It's good for them, but it's good for you because you can get that peace. You can qu quit stressing out. You can quit being up all night trying to think of ways to get back at them, ways to, to try to drag the truth out of them or the people around them. Have forgiveness. Let it go. Have your closure. Have your peace. The other thing of the many things that Jesus did for us, especially upon dying upon the cross, was something else other than just forgiveness. What was it? Freedom. He died for our freedom. Freedom from what you say? Freedom from sin. Freedom from addictions. Freedom from bondages. Freedom from, listen, Satan, the enemy, the great adversary, the powers of darkness. He died so that we could be free. Free here to have life and life more abundant and free to be able to go to heaven when we die. But we are supposed to have freedom and liberty in Christ, where the, the Spirit of the Lord is, is liberty, is freedom. So with that said, you've got to be willing 
to, to want people to be free, to want to be free yourself. And this is why it's important for you to be willing to say, okay, I'm ready to get out of this mess that I'm in. I'm willing to get to a point where I can tell the truth and just put the past behind me. Because until you get to a point where you can admit what you've done wrong and come clean, you will continuously not have true, full independence, true, full freedom. You will continue to duck and run and hide and hide behind other folks and hope and pray that, that folks uh, keep this lie up with you. And next thing you know, people are trying to blackmail you and, and take advantage of you and say, well, if you want me to keep this secret for you, you, you got to do this. You got to do that. You got to kiss my behind. You got to let me take advantage of you. You know, let me get one over on you. It's important to just uh, get to a point where you say, you know, I want freedom. I want my freedom. So there's got to be forgiveness and freedom. Forgiveness from one person, the one that was done wrong, and freedom for the person who's willing to, to come out and admit what was done wrong. Forgiveness and freedom. What this day is about, right? Freedom. With that said, let me also say this as I wrap this up. Think about it from the point of view of what happened with Adam and Eve when they sinned. They had a relationship, the perfect relationship with God because they had not sinned at first. And it's sin that separates us from God. So before they had sinned, before the fall of man, they had that perfect relationship. And so when they disobeyed God, they were not being faithful to their relationship with God. And so when they had sinned, they became ashamed of themselves and they started to hide. And so God's spirit enters in and he's calling out for them, where are you? Who told you you were naked? He's having a question and he's trying to have to get them out of their hiding spots. That's what you're doing. When you keep having to duck and dodge and run and hide and sweep stuff under the rug and be deceitful and make things appear this way and make it appear that way. This is what you're doing. You're hiding all because you screwed something up in your relationship. Instead of just coming out in the open and saying, okay, here I am. Yeah, I, I'm a little embarrassed. I'm a little ashamed, but here I am. And I'm ready to make things right. It's not good to do what Adam did and just point the finger at Eve and say, oh, well, you know, it's this woman's fault. It's this God's fault, blah, blah, blah. It's time to just take on responsibility. Grow up a little bit and say, okay, let's sit down. Let's have a chit chat. This is what has really happened. This is what has really went down. I hope and pray that you forgive me. I, I, I seek forgiveness, but more importantly, I seek freedom from this. I don't want to have to run and hide and be ashamed forever anymore. I just want to get this out of me, off my chest. I want the weight of the world off my shoulders. I want to just go and be free and have true liberty and freedom and independence. I just really want to be free for real now. Not this so-called freedom that I've had running and hiding. That is what you need this 4th of July. You need your true individual independence. We got it as a country, but what about you personally. Do you want this to be another 4th of July? In fact, what day are you on right now? Are you on day 4 of your lives? Is this, is this literally day 4 or day 5 or day 6? Are you on day uh, 365? Has it been a whole year of your life? What day lie are you on? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? At some point you got to say, you know, I don't want tomorrow to be the, 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 the sixth of my life, the, the, the sixth of your life, the seventh of your life. I just want to be truthful now. I just want to be free. Let this be a time and a season of true freedom. And I just hope that whoever needs this message gets it. 
I hope that you enjoyed it. I think it will help some people out. And uh, I'm just going to pray us out of here and hope and pray that it all goes well for you all. Heavenly Father, I thank you for another time to give another word. I know a lot of people are out celebrating this day. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that uh, uh, it's a day that I could minister something. Even when other people are out partying and having a good time, I don't think. I could think of a better place to be than somewhere uh, giving somebody a word. So I'm very thankful for that. And I just give you the praise and glory, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.